Shalom Harim. Today we were able to go into the old city. We went to the Wailing Wall and uh, over to the Mount of Olives. and was hoping to kind of film on location from the Mount of Olives, but was unable to due to, due to the high winds that we were having today in Jerusalem with a little cold front blowing in. Uh, and Saturday's footage that we took at the Garden Tomb ended up somehow, some mysterious way, got erased. Uh, we had the film footage, we were uploading it on the computer, and uh, I got a Skype call in while I was trying to upload it, and rather than declining it, I took the call, and then somewhere along the way I must have pushed the wrong button. It not only deleted what we would, had uploaded, but then it erased everything off of our memory stick as well. So now, by the way, if you try to Skype me, uh, and if I don't answer your call, please don't be offended because I'm not taking that chance a second time around. Uh, but we did get some footage today when we were at the Wailing Wall on the Mount of Olives, uh, different parts of the old city. And, uh, and we'll share those with you as I speak to you tonight. Now, the things that I'm going to speak to you tonight on, pretty much for most of you guys, it's nothing new. But when we load from Israel, it causes our videos to, to rank higher in Israel because we're using an IP address from home. And with it being home, as we call it, Israel, it will cause many Jewish people to find this in their search engines as well. Not just our Christian friends around the world, but now the Jewish people will begin to find these videos. So we trust this is a blessing for you. And, uh, and hope you enjoy the footage that you see as we talk about the different places here. I want to read with you a scripture from Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 53. It's a very contentious scripture for most Jews. And although it's so clear and so evident that it speaks of Mashiach and speaks clearly of Yeshua's identifying him to be Mashiach, Yet the rabbis for centuries have debated this very verse. And so I want to take you on a journey here. A journey that we walk today. That perhaps will open my own people's eyes that do listen to this message. Isaiah, Yeshayahu, Nun Gimel, chapter 53. Who would have believed our report... <clears throat> And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he grew up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He had no form nor comeliness that we should look at him, and no countenance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of pains and acquainted with sickness. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised and esteemed him not, and we esteemed him not. But in truth, he has borne our sicknesses and endured our pains. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded because of our transgressions, bruised because of our iniquities. His sufferings were that we might have peace. By his injury we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon Him. I think, brothers, as you listen to this scripture, think of Daniel chapter 9, when it speaks about the, our iniquity and our transgressions coming to an end in Daniel's 70th week, the conclusion of that week. He was oppressed, but he humbled himself and opened not his mouth. As a lamb which is brought to the slaughter, as a sheep before the shearers is, is dumb. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and false judgment was he taken away, and of his generation who considered. For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of the people to whom his, this stroke was due. See, should have been us, should have been the nation of Israel. They received that stroke of death. Just like Moses, when Moses stood in the gap for Israel, when God was ready to wipe Israel off the face of the map himself because his anger burned against us because of our rebellion for listening and making the golden calf that Aaron ended up making for the children of Israel because of their lust, thinking Moses had already died. God is not like that. 
He's not a God that you play with. And here we went into captivity in 70 AD. Are, are dispersed, not so much captivity, but we're dispersed to all the world. Is there not a reason why our people were dispersed throughout the entire world? We must think about these things. It's transgressions, it's sins. It's kind of ironic, though, that this man called Yeshua was crucified 70 years before that. That generation did not pass until exile to Israel was fulfilled. For they made his grave among the wicked, in his tomb, among the rich. Was it not a rich man that loaned his tomb to him? Right here at the garden tomb in Israel? Sure it was. Because he had done no violence, and neither was any deceit in his mouth, but it pleased the Lord to crush him by disease. If his soul should consider it a, a, a recompense for guilt, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the purpose of the Lord shall prosper. In his hand he shall see the travail of his soul. He shall be stated with seeing, sated with seeing, excuse me. By his knowledge did, he, did my servant justify the righteous one to the many and did bear their iniquity. Surely I will give him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. But he bore the sin of many and made an intercession for the transgressors. Today as I took my family and we went and we offered prayers for our friends around the world that are praying for us, we wanted to offer prayers for you. And then from there, we left the old city. We, we went out uh, and departed from the hotel where the Wailing Wall is. And we went to the east toward the Kidron Valley. And as we came up along the Kidron Valley there, you could look down, you could see the tomb that Absalom built for himself. And then through the Kidron Valley there, as you go up to the other side, you could see the Mount of Olives. In modern days now, you have the Church of All Nations there with the little domes on top of it, about, I don't know, maybe six to eight domes that were on top of that. In the background, you can see the Russian Orthodox Church with the golden uh, domes on it with the spears of crosses at the top. And... We went over there and we looked there and of course you get there to where the Church of All Nations are and it's called the Garden of Gethsemane there. Inside this church you have a place there where it is said that Yeshua went and he in agonizing asking God that this cup would pass from him but not his will but God's will be done. We also saw that the two olive trees that were over 2,000 years old these were the roots were analyzed and dated by the university here, the Hebrew University here in Jerusalem, and it was determined that these trees were over 2,000 years old. Now, that's been a number of years ago since that happened. And as I saw that, of course, I mentioned to my wife, I believe that they are here for two reasons. One, I believe that Yeshua prayed under those very trees, as you can see here in the video. And because the, the, the very Eitz Chayim, the very tree of life, came here on this earth in a human body, the mere fact that he touched them and no doubt maybe prayed under them or they shaded him from the heat of the day, that life has been given to them to live on. And... It also made me think of the two witnesses who are represented by the two olive trees of Zechariah chapter 4 on either side of the bowl. Like the candle stand over in Revelation. And we know that according to the word of God, these are the two witnesses, the two anointed ones of Revelation 11. In fact, there was a man that wrote me recently and he said to me, he was correcting me, he said, they do not bring fire down out of heaven. 
Well, maybe technically my wording was not exactly right, but the thing is, is God does say that if anyone should hurt them, fire proceedeth from their mouth and destroyeth their enemies. Now what is that? It's not a literal fire coming out of their mouth. But it's the fire of the Holy Ghost. In other words, when they speak, like when Eliyahu, when Elijah spoke himself, when the 50 soldiers came up and were disobedient before God, and he called fire down from heaven, and it devoured those soldiers for their disrespect. What was that? It literally was the fire from his mouth. It was the words that he spoke they were the Shekinah glory that came down and devoured the enemy. The two witnesses, the, the miracles and the things that happened with them are those things, it's the anointing of Almighty God. They can bring about any plague that whatever they desire. The water will be turned to blood. And they shall close the heavens that it doesn't rain in the days of their ministry. Clearly, Moshe Yahu, Moses and Elijah. And I know there's those that have different opinions on that, and that's okay. I love brothers and sisters that, that even if they differ with me on that, it's all right. But I'm here to lay in there the way that God has shown these things to me. Now, when we came there and we looked at the Kidron Valley, I say this for the sake of my Jewish brethren that would be watching this video. We contend with the Christians over Yeshayahu, Nun Gimel. And we say to them that this could not be Yeshua. But one, we try to say God could not be a man. Well, that's kind of contrary to our own Torah that teaches us in Barashit. Moshe writes in Barashit that God himself came down and was in one of those strangers. Because Moshe clearly wrote yod heh vav -He. Yod -He -Vav -He is what he wrote about him. He said, that's the one that spoke to Abraham and told him that Sarah laughed within her own heart. You say God cannot become a man. God became a man. Now, God created a body, whatever you want to say. Melchizedek could have been nothing less than Hashem on the earth, which Abraham paid a tithing unto him. When God said in His Word, in Barashit, Ve'yomet Elohim Yahior, God was making Himself tangible in a dimension in which we live in. Making Himself the Logos, the Shekinah glory. Who is Miruach HaKadosh? It's not some other man. We know that. The Ruach HaKadosh is the spirit of Almighty God Himself. Now, we find that in the beginning, God breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam. And the man became a living soul. What was that breath that he breathed in him? The eighth Chaim was the fruit from the tree of life. It is Hashem's own life coming into this man, into this body of flesh that God had made on the earth. And in fact, when he breathed it into Adam's nostrils, he breathed into him the breath of life for more than one. Nishmar Chaim. That was God's own life in a plural form being breathed into that body. And therefore, when Eve comes forth, when God takes and puts Adam into a deep sleep and opens up his side and takes from him Isha, there is no need to breathe in her nostrils any breath of life. Why? Because she comes forth filled with that life of Hashem. What the Christian people call the Holy Ghost. That's exactly what it was. But when the fall comes, the tree of life, the Eitz Chaim, is now guarded. 
God does not allow the access for that eternal life to be passed on, to be breathed into our children. And so we lose this part. But yet our children are still born. Eve, Chava, Chava, her name is given to her when the children first come forth, when Cain and Abel come forth. And Hashem prophesies to her. It says, Taladim Banim, you will birth sons. And one of them will cause you pain and the other one will cause you sorrow. Because God knew that one was going to kill the other. He knew this. Anyway, as time goes on and we move forward in time, Moshe, when he leads the children of Israel out of, the, out of Egypt, and we find that there comes a place in the scripture in Shemot, in Exodus, where God takes them, the children of Israel, they've, they've left Egypt, they've gone, they've crossed the Red Sea, Yom Suf, They've come to the other side. They're maybe two weeks into the journey. And after seeing all the miracles of Egypt, after seeing the parting of the Red Sea, they're already complaining. What, Moses, did you do? Bring us here to die in the wilderness with no water? What to God we stayed back in Egypt? What is it with man? What is it with man that, you know, God can show all these great miracles and let a little hardship come our way, and we're ready to complain already. God was only proving them to see would they believe Him. He would have brought the water regardless if they would just believe Him. But the whole purpose for them not believing was God was trying to show what was going to happen in the future that Israel was not going to believe God. That when God brought the rock there, they would look at the rock and say, there is no life in this rock. That's why Yeshayahu says, there was no beauty that we would desire Him, no form, no comeliness. He looked just like a rock. There's nothing there for us to believe, And so God was showing that we would not believe Him. Instead of believing Him, we would not. In fact, the very argument that Moshe says to us, the reason the place gets the name it does is because the, the argument was, is God among us or not? Isn't it funny that here we are, 3,500 years later, and the argument is still here today, is God among us or not? This is not even an argument amongst the Jews right now. This is an argument that even the Christian people are having. They can't make up their mind who this man, Yeshua, really is. They don't know. So the question is asked, well, is he God or is he not God? Well, maybe he's, he's not really God. He's He's, he's another guy. He's another person. You know, God, God Almighty is over here and Yeshua is over here. See, you can't make up your mind who He is. And yet the Word of God clearly, you know, I mean, if you read in the, in the, in the Christian text, it says that everything was created by Him and everything was created for Him. That's Yeshua. But in the Torah, it tells us everything was created by Hashem and there's nothing that exists that wasn't created by Him. In order to try to resolve this then, many Christians will say then, oh, they did it together. Besides, it says Elohim. And Elohim is plural, means there's more than one God. No, it doesn't mean this. In fact, had it, if it was really true, that they were side by side, father and son as we would think today, then God would have had to have wrote his Bible differently than what he wrote it. 
He wouldn't say, See, that's in the beginning, or at the first, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I understand the confusion because the Yod Mem at the end of the word of Elo. So it's Elohim. This is because God can change his form, the way he presents himself. But in order for there to be two there, if the theory would be correct, the scripture would have had to have read, Belashit Bohim Elohim, et hashemaim ve'et ha'aretz. Because in Hebrew, you must pluralize the verb that goes with the noun or the adjective. And if there's only one God, it'll be singular. See, and this is the difference. This is why the Jewish people know something's wrong. Something is wrong in the theology that we're hearing. And why? Because Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Hero is the Lord thy God is one God. Yeshayahu clearly tells us in chapter 43, Isaiah 43, there is no Savior beside me. No, I know not none. But what it was, God himself transformed himself into a man. He made himself a body in which God himself dwelt in. So see, God can become a man. God can become anything he wants to be. And so my Jewish brethren, do you not realize this is what God was doing when we had this argument 3,500 years ago? He was prophesying to us, you're going to do the same thing 1,500 years later. When I send you the rock, you're going to complain and say, is this really God among us? In fact, we wanted to stone Yeshua because he said he's the son of God. And we said you make, your, you make yourself equal because you say you're the son of God. So we took up stones. We're ready to kill him. And then Yeshua says, you say in your own word, in the Nevim, in the prophets, that to whom the word of God comes to, that they're gods. And he agreed. He said, and they are. Because why? We see with Moshe, God says to Moshe, Achon, Aaron, he will be your Navi, your prophet, and you will be God to Pharaoh, Elohim to Pharaoh. Isn't it interesting? Why? Because the word of God came to him, and the word of God that was proceeding from him and from his mouth made him God to Pharaoh. So why then can we not believe then that God could not come in a human being? If God could manifest his self through Moses, and keep in mind, no wonder Moses had to veil his face when he came down from the mountain because of the glory of God that shone upon him. Why did he veil his face? He was trying to show us that God himself would come in a human being, in a man, and would be veiled in a human body. He'd be behind the veil. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture that we see here. Now, there, there's so many stories in the Bible. And we think about, as, as I took and I went to the Kidron Valley and the Mount of Olives, you know, a lot of times the Jewish, uh, my Jewish brothers and sisters, we think this is only a special place for Christians. You know, the Mount of Olives, because Jesus prayed there. Have we forgotten what happened in 2 Samuel? Have we forgotten that down in the Kidron Valley, there is a monument to us, Absalom, Absalom, made himself a tomb. It's a good thing he did because... He died and he would end up being, needing to be put in there. His name means, my father is peace. Speaking of David, now David, we know clearly that Moshiach would be the son of David. And that he would come. Moshe said, 
the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like unto me. And him you will hear. And all those that do not hear would be cut off. It is time for our ears to come open. It is time for us to hear and to believe what God has done in this day. David plays out the entire scenario. Absalomon, what does he do? Absalomon takes and perfectly is like Israel. David is anointed king. And Absalomon goes and he gets the people in behind the scenes to conspire against David. And he gets them in favor of himself. Is this not what our, the elders did when the time when Yeshua, when they brought him up for judgment? They go and they got all of the people of the synagogues to say, speak against him, speak against him, speak against him. I mean, the history is there. How are we going to deny it? Just like Absalomon, we were living the life of Absalomon. <laughs> and Absalomon raises himself up above his father David. Exalts himself through the flatteries of the people. Now David could have taken and stopped the whole thing. In fact, his men come to him and said to him, we would fight. What do you want us to do, David? And David said, it would be too much bloodshed. We will leave the city in peace. Oddly enough, though, David leaves behind seven concubines which to me clearly speaks of the seven churches of Revelation that John wrote about, which typed out the Gentile believers through the next 2,000 years. Concubines. What are concubines? Common law women. They're wives of David, but they're common law. And that's what this all is about this, this thing called the bride of Christ. Bride of Moshiach. They're common law wives. Why? Because... We rejected him. And then what, did, what happened? David, when he left, he could, have, he could have put down the rebellion. What happened when they went, when the priest and his guards went to get Yeshua out of the garden over there on the Mount of Olives? What happened? Peter pulls his sword out and cuts the servant of the high priest's ear off. He's ready to fight. Yeshua tells him, put away your sword. Could I not, if I needed, call of my father ten legions of angels and we'd put an end to all of this right now? It wasn't the hour. Just like David knew, it wasn't the hour. Now, Yeshua, he goes and he crosses the Kidron Valley. Now, this is before this incident happens. And when he does, he comes up on the Mount of Olives. He weeps over Jerusalem. and says, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. He said, your house is left to you desolate until you say, Baruch Haba Adonai. Blessed is he that comes. Beshem Adonai. In the name of the Lord. Baruch Haba Beshem Adonai. It's actually Hashem. Your house is left to you desolate. What house? He's not talking about the temple. He's talking about your soul, your heart, your house. Bait la vie. The house of your heart will be left desolate without the Holy Ghost until you say, Baruch haba, b'sham aranai. It's that simple. It's that simple, my brothers. That simple. Now, strange thing is, we are here. David goes up on the, on the uh, Mount of Olives as well. He covers his head. You know, we, we sit there. So many people think, this is just a tradition you guys do, keeping uh, wearing of a kippah. There's no place in the law that says that. Moshe did not give this in the law. That's true. None of the prophets, no, none of, you know, no, no, Naveen, none of the prophets did either. That's true. But you know, God has made us wore this kippah for 2,000 years. You want to know why? And it's funny because we even cite the fact that David and his men covered their heads and went up the Mount of Olives mourning over what Absalomon did. Think about that. 
And so we have been for 2,000 years covering our head, thinking it's a tradition that God is above us. No, we're doing it because we're mourning, and we don't even know what we're mourning about. And let me share with you something else as well. When David, after he mourned over Israel and his men, they took and they left. And they go towards the, the Jordan as they go up to the top of the mountain before they get to going down towards Jericho and the Jordan there. Shimei, Saul's son, comes out and he's throwing stones at them and he's cursing them. Cursed be you, David. Cursed be all those that are with you, David. He spits upon them. And one of David's men said, let, he said, my Lord, let me take that dog's head off his body. And David said, don't do it. God has told him to do this. David, he didn't realize it, but he knew that God had told him that. Why? Because it was going to be, I don't know how many years it was, five, six hundred years later, that the son of David was going to come on this scene. And the same thing was going to happen to him, that they were going to spit on him and curse him. And David was playing out. He was playing out the whole type of Yeshua, just like Yosef, just like Joseph played out that type of Yeshua as well. So David, they cross the Kidron Valley. They go on up. Shemai does all this evil to him. He crosses the Jordan River. And then two of the priests come out to David. <laughs> you know, that, that's an interesting one right there. They come out to David before he crosses the Jordan. It seems like to me Yeshua on Mount Transfiguration before he crossed the Jordan, had two that came to him as well. And that was Moshe Yahu, Moses and Elijah. That's exactly right. The two on either side of the, of the lampstand now, the two olive trees are standing there, right there before him. I mean, God is typing the whole thing out for us. How can, I mean, Yeshua is even typing out the two witnesses for the future. And those two that came down to David before they were to go over, before he was across the Jordan, and he asked them a favor. He says, don't go with me. Stay behind. I have a work for you to do. Now see, Moses and Elijah are just in another dimension. And I'll share something with you. Those of you that may not know this, because there's many of you that maybe have not ever heard me say this. Remember how in the Christian Bible, it's written about how that Moses is, dis excuse me, Satan disputes with Michael the archangel about the body of Moses. You know why? Chuck Mister asked me that question when we were together. He says, what's all that about? And when the Lord revealed that to me, it blew me away. The reason why Satan argues with Michael the archangel of the body of Moshe for Moses is because he knew that the word says that he would not let his Holy One see corruption. Okay, the argument didn't come up until after Yeshua come on the scene. Why? Satan thought that Moses had to have been that anointed one. The only problem was is he kept seeing prophecies about another one coming and he's like, Okay, he never got the body of Moses. It, his body didn't see corruption. And then Yeshua comes, and he doesn't see corruption. It's, just an, it's a problem for, for Satan. He's, all right, which one is the Messiah then? Neither one of them saw corruption. Where is Moses' body then? Because he couldn't find a place in the Word where there would be two that would not see corruption. That's why. And... God does Moses like David did the two there. I have a work for you still yet. Wait here for a little bit. Now, him and Elijah are just in another dimension. And they were able to appear to Peter, James, and John. I believe that's right. Forgive me if I got that wrong. I got to say that because, you know, if I get one wrong, I'm not reading it directly. I'll hear from it, boy. God knows my heart. You know, I, I, I don't mean to make a mistake like that. But if I got it wrong, forgive me. You got to remember, you guys probably read the New Testament more than I have. But anyway, he goes on over there. And while Absalomon is gone, and of course the two witnesses go back. Now, also, there are two, so what's interesting is it mentions there are two sons that go with them. 
Now, we never really see anything about the two sons, but you know, Moses and Elijah had sons as well. Spiritually speaking, Elisha, God commanded Elisha, Elijah that Elisha would be, take his place as his spiritual son. God commanded Moses that Joshua would be his spiritual son, would take his place. I know it doesn't quote-unquote say son, spiritual son, but he says there'll be a prophet in your room, which means they would take your place. Both are used the same Hebrew exp expression about them. So they both have sons in this case here, and they both continue the work that their predecessors started. Now, as we look at the story of David, though, while David is in exile, if Solomon dies, he's killed. And there's one thing that used to trouble me when I would see Absalom's death, because David so mourned for Absalom. As evil and as wicked as Absalom was, David mourned for him like no tomorrow. And even David's chief soldier said to him, you bring an embarrassment upon us for those that have fought and died for you because of the way you mourn over David, over Absalom. And David said, I would to God that I could have died instead of him. My brother, do you not know that that was a type of Yeshua? When he wept over Jerusalem, how often I would have hovered you? The thing is, is what David could not do, what David was showing in a type, if I could have only died for you of Solomon, but he knew he couldn't do it, but if only if he could have, whereas Yeshua, he was showing that Yeshua would come and do that very thing. He would die and take his place. That's what that was about. Incredible, wasn't it? So anyway, my brothers, as we begin to see when David is getting ready to come back, and we see also there is a prophecy that Yeshua is going to come back. But before Yeshua can come back, Israel must be gotten in one mind and one accord. So David sends word to the two priests. And he says, get the people in one heart. And those two priests got the people of Israel in one heart to receive David. The two anointed ones, Zechariah 4, are to do just that. They're to get the people in one heart and one mind to receive. To receive who? To receive Yeshua. That's what they're here to do. Now, as I get ready to close, let me just share with you this here. If you begin to look at this, this is why we see in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12, where it talks about they will look upon him and they will see him whom they pierced and they will weep and they will mourn as a family that lost their only son. It says that God says here in Zechariah chapter 12 that he must first bring back the, the lost of Judah first. Do you know why? Because it was the house of Judah it was our fathers, our forefathers that were guilty of the blood of Yeshua. When Daniel says that he must finish the transgression and make an end of sin, that is the transgression and that is our sin, is that we rejected Yeshua. And that's got to be corrected. And that's what God comes to do. Isn't it odd when you read in Zechariah, do you realize that it's actually the tribe of Judah or the house of Judah that is actually represented there? David, the house of David and his wives apart, the house of Nathan and his wives apart, they're both from the tribe of Judah. The house of Levi and their wives apart, that's the Levites, they were there, part of the house of Judah. The house of Shimei apart and his wives apart, the tribe of Benjamin, which is the house of Judah. And by the way, in an interesting how he brings out Shimei, my brother, and it's a sign to us as Jews that Shimei is the one that spit upon him. No wonder why Joseph, years and years before this ever happened, he takes his cup and puts it in Benjamin's bag. Benjamin was innocent. Why did he put it in Benjamin's bag? 
the innocent brother who did not sell out Yosef to the, to the Ishmaelites. He was not sold out and taken to a caravan down into Egypt and sold there to the Egyptians, to Potiphar's wife, or, or Potiphar. See, but he was exalted up. But where did he put the cup? He put it in Benjamin's bag, the one that is innocent. God was prophesying to us, letting us know that it would be Benjamin in the future that would spit on the king. It'd be his descendants that would reject Yeshua when he came. It'd be his descendants that would reject King David as being king over Israel. This is why the cup is put in to Benjamin's back. Because God would hold him responsible because it was Shemai that spit on David that cursed David and his men. And in the days when Yeshua was on earth, the Benjamites were the ones cursing Yeshua and saying away with him. Let me share this with you, my brethren. As our forefathers cried out and my mother's side was there, part of the Jews that were doing this, my father's side was already dispersed to Morocco from the first dispersion of 753 AD, or BC, excuse me, BC. But you know what was going on? Through this rejection, what was happening? Our fathers rejecting them. Joseph. But by God's grace, by God's mercy, though Joseph, when we, or excuse me, when we cried out for his blood, let his blood be upon us and on our children. Had God not applied that blood, as a sacrifice. There would be no house of Judah. There would be no Benjamites, no, no tribe of Judah, no tribe of Levi. There would be, there would be no Samaritans. We would be wiped off the face of the earth just like the other ten brothers that rejected Joseph would have been wiped off the face of the earth had they not offered the blood upon his coat and God accepted it as a sacrifice, those ten tribes would have been wiped out. And in the days of the house of Judah, the rest would have been wiped out. You know, God requires that there be a, a lamb offered up once a year for the sins of the people of Israel, to have their sins confessed upon that lamb, and the lamb to be taken out into the wilderness and turned loose. If there hadn't have been that lamb that took and became the sacrificial lamb and had the ability to go into the wilderness and carry our sins far away, then there would be no sacrifice for sins for the last 2,000 years. My brethren, it's time for us to consider what Hashem has done for us in this day. God bless you. Baruch Chaba b'shem Adonai. V'gam husham Yeshua HaMashiach. L'alatov. Shalom Kharim. This is Stephen Bindanur, and we are here at the Wailing Wall in Israel. And we have gone and we have prayed for many of you guys, all of you that have supported with your love, your prayers, your financial contributions as well, to make these things possible. There was one particular person that came on my heart, though, especially when I went before the wall to pray, and that was the noble's daughter. I prayed for her, and I included her name in the wall. There were others as well, but in particular, my heart really has been burdened for this little girl, 10 years old. It desperately needs God alive. Also, we wanted to let you know that we are going, we will be again going to the wall praying for you guys in particular, those that have needs, whether it be healing, financial, domestic, whatever the case may be. So please email us your prayer request at IsraelReturns at AOL.com. And we will include all of these requests 
and a little note to, to try to make it like one sentence or two sentence so that I can get everything on one page and we can place your request in the wall. And I will pray over them, each one, as I come before the Lord, before Hashem, here in Israel. God bless you, and we love you, and we thank you for all that you do to make these things possible. Baruch Hashem.